And thanks to the choir for summing that up so beautifully and so well. Our scripture today is from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. But an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he rose and went. And behold, an Ethiopian, Ethiopian, a eunuch, a minister of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians in charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this, as a sheep led to the slaughter or a lamb before its shearer is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken up from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, pray, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news of Jesus. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught up Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing on, he preached the gospel to all the towns till he came to Caesarea. May God bless the hearing of his word. So if we say that scripture contains all that is necessary for salvation, we're going to look at a story, one of the early stories of salvation, of this Ethiopian eunuch that the Holy Spirit takes to Philip, or takes Philip to. Now I want to start and set in context, because Acts reads out to us how this Ethiopian eunuch, in all of his brave grace, had gotten himself to Jerusalem to worship. What we miss, um, being in a context that's a couple thousand years later, is that there was no way that he would have worshipped there, that he would have been let into the temple. And so we turn to Deuteronomy. John, if you'll hit that slide. He whose testicles are crushed or whose male member is cut off shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Not only was this eunuch uh, born of a foreign national origin, um, but um, he did not have his testicles or his male member. And so he would have traveled all of that way to come to worship and would not have been able to worship. And so he's reading, right, this passage from the suffering servant of Isaiah, where we just read in our liturgy and prayed together about how Jesus has become this suffering servant for us to break the cycle of violence. And if I were that eunuch, I would have been resonating a lot with that passage and about justice denied and the, the sufferings of coming to find something, to seek something, and being shut off and cut away. There was reform that had tried to happen to allow eunuchs to come in. Um, this law from Deuteronomy was written before the fall of Judah and Jerusalem, before the Babylonian exile. And while in exile, um, there would have been decisions that the Israelites would have had to make of where they can work and how they can survive. 
And many of those decisions um, would have involved um, becoming a eunuch, um, and they very well could have been presented with the option to um, have themselves castrated in order to serve in the court at the Babylonians, or to be killed, or to work in conditions um, that would not have afforded a living wage, shall we say, um, that might have happened in the temple. And so knowing all of this, um, when the Israelites come back to rebuild Jerusalem, when the exile is over and the king of Persia releases them, now there are eunuchs um, among them where it wasn't before. And what do you do um, when they are denied from the assembly? And we have a prophet, Isaiah, who calls out. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls, this is the temple, a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which shall not be cut off. A prophet who calls for hope. A prophet who calls for a new rule given a new context. A prophet who calls for reconciliation. A prophet who calls for a connection and a channel for God's grace to flow through. But it requires some bravery. It requires re-envisioning the world as the Israelites had been taught. It requires making room where they hadn't had to before. And it's not a practice that took hold. And so the eunuch showed up at the temple. And we can't say, of course, for 100% sure, but from what we know, um, he was most likely turned away, except for the Holy Spirit who worked in spite of the temple and the institution, who worked through a disciple who heard the Spirit calling him to go to this random road, this wilderness, at this time, and Philip did it. He left whatever he was doing, he made room for the Spirit's nudge and showed up and found this eunuch and followed the nudge again to speak with him. And in his speaking, he found that the eunuch was reading this passage from Isaiah and asking. And so he's teaching and telling about Jesus, about Christ, about salvation. And the eunuch is so moved and has been so hungry that now he is finding and being given what he was seeking after and wanting. He stops and looks at a body of water and says, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Everything, your national origin, your gender, your race, your economic condition, your marital status, everything, and nothing. And Philip chose the nothing. And we know that this nothing was the exact reason that the Holy Spirit had put him present in that moment, for that moment of salvation, because as soon as he baptizes the eunuch, the Holy Spirit whisks him away again, and the eunuch continues on. At the beginning, the road that was named that the eunuch was on was a desert road. That's Bible code for wilderness, which is Bible code for God struggle, for seeking. And this passage ends with the eunuch continuing on his way, which is Bible code for going forward in God's will. Because if there was something that needed to be changed, it would have been that he turned around and went back home or went back somewhere to the place. Because repentance literally means a turning around. And so that's one way scripture flags that journey for us. But the eunuch was already on that road and searching, and Philip brought through brave grace that word that he needed. And Philip went on, and the eunuch went on, and salvation was present. 
And so today and every day, we have a choice of what kind of disciple we will be. We have a choice of what kind of church we will be. We have a choice of what kind of grace we will share and live into. And this is a choice that's before the United Methodist Church right now. This week, um, we had a news release of amendments that we were voting on. Um, just a real quick context, um, we have a global meeting that changes, that can bring changes to our book of discipline every four years, and that met in 2016. And that body put forth five amendments um, to change our constitution. We are very similar to the United States because we were both brought together, organized at the same time. Um, and so for those five constitutions that are five amendments that are recommended um, for them to go into effect, two thirds of the annual conferences worldwide globally have to approve them. The first two had to do with gender equality. Um, and just so for those of you who know, we're also in a debate around sexuality. This did not include that. This is gender and not sexuality. And so the First Amendment added language that both men and women are made in the image of God and that we will confront and seek to eliminate discrimination against women and girls. And that received a vote of 66.5%, which means it did not pass. It means that we could not, in a unified voice as the United Methodist Church, make this statement of value together. And lest our racism kick in, it was the Philippines who overwhelmingly voted for this vote. And it was, oh, I forgot the figures up with me, 25.9% of the United States who voted against this vote, this amendment. The Holy Spirit worked through Philip to bring a corrective to the temple church of that day. Our United Methodist Church began as a movement to correct the Anglican Church and its lack of social justice awareness at the time of Industrial Rev Revolution. I think our question for us today is who will be the movement that corrects us? Who will be the disciples who exercise brave grace who are our prophetic voices? Who do we need to be listening to? What fear do we need to step beyond and into a place where we can say to the eunuch that there is nothing to prevent him from being baptized? There have been um, more press releases as the week has turned out, um, and it's starting to bubble up that it looks like there was one sentence in particular in this First Amendment um, that caused it to not pass. And that is that the United Methodist Church recognizes it is contrary to scripture and to logic to say that God is male or female, as maleness and femaleness are characteristics of human bodies and cultures, not characteristics of the divine. And the breakdown for that, um, as we're understanding it, was that we can say that we are made in the divine image, male and female, but when we go back the other way to say that God is beyond gender, that God is specifically beyond maleness, we can't do that. Um, and I'm not quite sure what that disconnect is because it doesn't fit together logically, um, but that is what has been shared um, from uh, a, a couple articles interviewing people from North Texas who voted against this um, and from, I believe, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And so we will be um, in holy conferencing around this again, this annual conference, um, as this um, sentence that was included um, was struck. All right, you know what? If you want that detail, come and see me. I'm not going to spend time to get into that little bit, but we will be revoting on the First Amendment. The Second Amendment um, adds that, nor shall any member be denied access to an equal place in the life, worship, and governance of the church because of race, color, gender, national origin, ability, age, marital status, or economic condition. And this one got even less support um, than the first one. And 
specifically stated in the articles that have come since then is pastors and laity wanting to be able to turn people away um, based on some of these things and specifically to not have to give them the sacraments that would be included in worship. This is the Bible passage that we are living out with Philip and the eunuch. Um, And it is my deep lament and deep prayer that we can find in this story of God's salvation space for us to live into this with a lot more brave grace, with a lot more room, with a lot more margin um, for God and the Holy Spirit to be at work, that we too can find ourselves on the road that the Holy Spirit points us to, that we can be the people that the Holy Spirit works through instead of in spite of. As we move into the time of the church, um, I would